Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to my very overdue September reading wrap up and my slightly less overdue October wrap up. So I sound like a broken record, I know this, but obviously um, if you are a subscriber to my channel then you know that I took off the month of October because of business trips and a vacation, which meant that I didn't get the opportunity to film my se September wrap up at the end of September and I'm just back now so I'm finally getting to sit down to film October. But this is not my usual filming day. I usually film on a Saturday and it is Friday evening right after work so I am going to be having a tipple while I talk about books so hopefully I don't get even more rambly than I normally do um, but essentially September and October end up being good months to combine because overall I didn't read as much during either month as I normally do life was just really really busy I wasn't necessarily home or in a place where I could readily like pick up a physical book and read so I ended up reading eight books between the two months total, um, which is normally what I average, I think, for a single month. So it was definitely a lighter reading period for me than usual. So it ended up making perfect sense to combine them. Also, I noticed <laughs> in kind of looking over the titles that I'm going to be talking about that this was a really, really, really romance heavy month for me, or romance heavy two months, I guess. Um, basically four of the eight titles are romance, and if you include the two Outlander books that I finished, which you could certainly make a case that they are romance, six of the eight books were romance. So very uncharacteristic reading month for me. And I also realize, I say that it was like light reading months but probably the two Outlander books that I read total like something like 3,000 pages alone so make of that what you will but why don't we just dive right into the books so the first book that I want to talk about is actually one that I ended up DNFing and that is The Wisteria Society of Lady Scoundrels by India Holt and this is a book that I listened to as an audiobook. I made it roughly 20% of the way in. Um, it is a historical romance set in Victorian England, which I know I'm particularly drawn to. A lot of the historical romances that I read, that I have read, have been set in that time period. So I thought, why not? This was also a book that had kind of come like had been put on my radar I guess because I was looking for books similar to the Evie Dunmore books that I could read while I was waiting for the third book in her series to come out um, which it eventually did and that's actually another book that I'm going to be talking about later in this video but I picked this up as an audiobook and the idea of it, the premise, is that the heroine is this young woman who belongs to this secret society in Victorian England, this sort of crime sorority, as it were, and the love interest is this sometime assassin who's actually been contracted to kill her. So there's that, but he is like smitten with her from the moment he lays eyes on her. It's very much a love at first sight sort of deal. Um, the problem with this is that I didn't realize that when the like book flap said that Cecilia flies around England that they meant literally 
So, basically, the women who belong to this secret society, the Wisteria Society, fly their houses around England like they're pirate ships because of some sort of enchantment. And there's a lot of, like, talk and, like, sort of swashbuckling lingo thrown in to this really fantastical situation, which I was not <laughs> prepared for. And I am not someone who is particularly drawn to fantasy as a genre. And this was probably just a little bit too much fantasy for me. Um, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with the book. From the 20% that I read, I think that it was actually quite funny and lighthearted. And if you are one of those people that can appreciate a fantasy setting and can kind of suspend disbelief, then it might be an option for you, but it was just not what I was looking for. So as I said, I did end up DNFing it at around 20%. The next book though, my friends, my fellow bibliophiles, was the polar opposite because this was a five star and if I could give it more than a five star, I would. <laughs> the book that I'm talking about is Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert, which is the second book. Second book is the alcohol already setting in. This could be thoroughly entertaining for you, but really, really bad for me. But this is the second book in the Brown Sister trilogy, it's focused obviously on Danny Brown, Danica Brown, and this book. It's almost blasphemous to say that you prefer a sequel to the original, but I do honestly think that I preferred this book to Chloe Brown. And I think part of that might be because Danny as a character resonated with me a little bit more. She was a character that I could see bits and pieces of myself in. She is a PhD student. Um, she, in English in particular, she has some witchy vibes going on. There were some like things about her personality that just when I read them, I had to laugh because I could so relate to them. And so there was just something about her that really, really clicked. And when I say, when I talk about clicking, the chemistry between Danny Brown and Zaff, oh my lord. So <laughs> um, basically the book is a fake dating trope situation, which I think that might be the first time I've read that trope in romance, and Danny Brown and Zaff are friendly at the beginning of the book. He's like the security guard for the building, and they get along. There's like some sexual tension between them, but basically there is a fire drill that goes awry, and he rescues Danny and it's caught on video and the clip goes viral across social media and becomes this whole thing and they realize that if they pretend to be a couple because everyone has called this like rug bay um, situation but if they take advantage of the like publicity that they're getting they could really help Zaf's like charity organization. So they decide to fake date to help him out, to use the publicity for good, and obviously it is a romance, so things happen, things get steamy. And when I say steamy, Chloe Brown was hot. Like it was. And this book made Chloe Brown sex scenes seem like foreplay in my mind. That was like Talia Hibbert warming up. 
because these were on a whole other level. They were off the chart and whew, it was just, it was just amazing. But I mean, I think apart from the like steam factor and chemistry between the characters, I think beyond the connection that I had with Danica, the book itself also deals with some like more serious topics um, with Zaf when it comes to like mental health and dealing with grief and the death of a parent and it does that all really beautifully as part of like the character development and part of the relationship between them and kind of how they end up making things work. So I did think it handled all of those things well but I would say that yes this is a romance book but there are some weightier subjects there so just bear that in mind but it was so good I loved it this was five stars if I could give it more stars than that I absolutely would I thoroughly enjoyed it I also listened to it as an audiobook and it wasn't Lady Danbury from Bridgerton narrating it if I remember rightly which definitely made for a smoother reading experience from Chloe Brown so there is that. Alrighty, so next up is a graphic biography or graphic nonfiction that is Blues for Lady Day, the story of Billie Holiday by Paolo Parisi. And so I actually picked this up from McNally Jackson, which is my favorite indie bookstore in New York City. Um, I picked it up because I happened to be in the neighborhood at my friend Liz's baby shower. And I read this the same day on the train ride home, which is about an hour long. It is not a long graphic biography. It's a little over a hundred pages. Um, but I was really, really fascinated by this because a couple months ago, I finally, finally sat down and watched the United States versus Billie Holiday, the biopic with Andra Day as Billie Holiday, and she does a phenomenal job in that portrayal. Like, there's a reason during awards season she was, like, killing it. Um, so I had watched that and was completely astonished, shocked, mortified by the story it was telling. I grew up in a household where jazz is king. My father is a jazz enthusiast. He was a jazz musician, a drummer. He has a lot of respect for that particular type of music. So I grew up always knowing about and being familiar with Billie Holiday's songs. But the movie itself is about essentially how certain lawmakers went to very great lengths to try to silence Billie Holiday because of her singing in public the song Strange Fruit, which is this really haunting song about lynching in the South. And they were concerned that there was going to be civil unrest if she continued to sing this song publicly. And so because she was a known drug abuser, they tried to use that to silence her. They had her arrested, sent her to jail. They used that to like take away the card she needed in order to sing in nightclubs to keep her silent, to prevent her from earning her livelihood. And it's just devastating. So when I saw this, when I happened to be in McNally Jackson looking at their graphic novel section, I was really drawn to it and was really hoping that it would give me a little bit of the same thing. This wasn't quite that. I feel like if anything, it was like an ode to Billie Holiday. Um, it was something that paid like homage to her 
as an individual, I don't feel that it gave a whole lot of substance about her life, which is what I want when I read some sort of biography. So in that way, I don't think it did exactly what I had hoped for. And so I ended up giving it three stars. I do think that it captured some sort of essence or some sort of emotion um, or evoked something about Billie Holiday that was quite nice and beautiful and poetic. Um, but when you say the story of Billie Holiday, I'm thinking he's going to be more like fact-based and it really didn't touch on anything that was in the movie. So if you read this alone, hadn't seen the movie, you wouldn't have known any of that had happened. Um, the art in it is all black and white, which I thought was quite dramatic. Um, I do feel like I might have read another um, graphic biography by Paolo Parisi. I'll have to check that. So I may or may not be familiar with Paolo's style of writing. But yeah, this was like a solid three stars, but I do think the movie did a significantly better job at looking at her life and there are probably like other biographies out there that if you're really interested in her would probably be a better fit. Moving on to Portrait of a Scotsman by Evie Dunmore, which is the third book in Evie Dunmore's A League of Extraordinary Women series. And this is a series that I started reading last year, fell in love with it, was highly anticipating this, had pre-ordered it, and it arrived, and I was super excited to read it right as I got here, and then life interfered. But I did end up listening to this actually as an audiobook while I was on my business trip, and this is one of these books that it took a little time for me to warm up to Hattie. Hattie is the heroine, but I loved Lucien, the love interest, basically from the start. I mean, he's Scottish, which does it for me, generally speaking. Um, he's a little bit of a bad boy, again, that does it for me. His physical description is pretty on brand for what I like in men. Um, and there was something just about his personality that I really enjoyed. Hattie, on the other hand, took me a little while to warm up to. There was just something about her personality, the decisions she was making, she just kind of irked me a little bit. But I ended up falling in love with her basically alongside Lucien, which made for a really fun and enjoyable ride. So essentially, Hattie is this daughter of a very wealthy businessman, and her father and mother kind of have set her sights on her marrying into, like, the peerage, ennobling herself, as it were because they have tons of money, so that's not really a concern, but having a lady in the household would be quite charming. Um, unfortunately for Hattie, she finds herself in a very compromising situation with Lucien in public, and that kind of means that she is forced to marry him to kind of protect her reputation and that of her family. And things are really bumpy with them at the start. Like, it's obviously a forced sort of situation, um, but there is chemistry there. There definitely is. And for all the, like, rumors and the bad boyish things about Lucien, like, he is actually quite the romantic in my mind. Like, he was very open about the fact that he would not stray from his wife, even in this situation where he didn't necessarily, like, court her the right way and things, as I said, are forced. Um, and 
he is really all about communication, which I found incredibly hot. He wanted Hattie to explain to him what she wanted, um, to tell him what she didn't want, to really talk to him and trust him. And that in turn becomes part of the problems in their relationship. There are quite a few situations over the course of the book where she doesn't trust him and that opens a whole can of worms and causes all sorts of miscommunications between them. But when they do communicate, it is magic. And I think that's also part of why I really, really enjoyed Lucien as a character. Um, he is a this character where consent is really important, and I thought that was a really, really powerful point to drive home in this particular book. As I said, Lucian had my heart from the beginning. It never wavered. Um, Hattie, I didn't always see eye to eye with her. Some of the choices she made, both at the beginning of the book and towards the end of the book, I didn't necessarily agree with but things happen, you know. Um, I would say that there are some darker elements to this story as well, so keep that in mind because yes, again, this is a romance, but this is also a book that is dealing with sort of the effects of industrialization, so there is a lot of talk of coal mining and a look at sort of the difficult lifestyle, the diff difficult way of life that like these mining towns have. But so there are some more dark, sinister things going on with Lucian as a character who is definitely a little bit more roguish, a little bit darker than I would say the other Evie Dunmore like heroes or love interests are. But this was a really, really good book. I truly enjoyed it. I thought the audiobook version was really well done as well. And so I ended up giving this four and a half stars. So there you go. The next book is definitely one of those books that I feel like could very well get me canceled. Because this book is definitely very hyped. And as my subscribers know, hype gives me hives. So I had reservations about this book, but I still went in with an open mind. And unfortunately, it didn't work out for me. The book I'm talking about is Velvet Was the Night by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. And I read this for my work book club. It was the book that we read for September. Um, for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I've heard so much about Mexican Gothic, like so, so much. I feel like it is a booktube, a bookstagram, a book talk darling. It's everywhere. And I know how many people love Sylvia Moreno Garcia's writing. But this for me fell really flat. Um, I thought the writing itself was just kind of mediocre at best, maybe. Um, and I felt that a lot of the story felt very contrived and like very, very calculated, if that makes any sense. So the big general premise of this is that it's set in the 1970s in Mexico City where there's a lot of sort of unrest and the main character is this girl named Mate who is kind of a sad individual. Like she's a little bit pathetic. She is in her early 30s so around my age, doesn't really have a great like a lot of self-esteem. She lives for her like romantic like comic books novella type things like she lives through them she uh, like really lives through them kind of to the obsessive amount she's a little bit of a kleptomaniac who 
is like her buildings live in pet sitter, but she doesn't seem particularly fond of pets, but when she pet sits for someone, she like takes something from their home. It's very weird. Um, but essentially one of her neighbors asks her to watch her like cat while she goes away and this triggers this whole thing because Leonora, the neighbor, um, ends up being involved in this like student group of activists and a bunch of people are looking for her because she has these incriminating photos um, that could do a lot of damage if they damage if they get out into the world. Enter Elvis, <laughs> who is this thug who is obsessed with Elvis Presley, who is also kind of on the hunt for Leonora because of all of this stuff that's going on. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but that's the best I can do, guys. Um, so it's t the story itself is two POVs, these two characters who are in effect looking for the same thing but for very different reasons. Um, and you kind of sort of see Matei through Elvis's POV um, until they finally kind of cross paths later on in the book. And there's like a lot of intrigue and mystery, but as I said, it all felt really, really forced. Certain decisions that Sylvia Moreno Garcia made were just so obviously made to drive the plot forward that it felt really unnatural to me. Um, and as I said, I didn't really think all that much of the writing, like mediocre at best. The characters to me were also pretty two-dimensional. They were really quirky in their own ways, which was interesting, but I also feel like that was really all that was brought to the table with any of them. So unfortunately, this was not a book that I particularly enjoyed. I ended up giving it 2.75 stars, and <laughs> the reason for the 0.75 is because I've recently started using the story graph. Um, I'm still on both the story graph and Goodreads, but I am hoping in 2022 to move officially over to the story graph so I'm not giving Amazon any more of my money um, than I have to, which is quite a lot to be quite honest at this point. So that's that's the plan is to move over to the story graph so I will probably start ranking books, rating books, more along the scale that they allow there. Um, and this is a sl shameless plug for my story graph. I've put the link in the description box and if you are on the story graph make sure you add me. I need friends over there. But yes, I did give it 2.75 stars. It wasn't quite a three star rating for me. Um, I think it had some issues overall, but it definitely wasn't as bad as to warrant like a two. So that's, that's where I ended up. We're going to talk about the next two books kind of together because they're both Outlander books. So we have Drums of Autumn, which is book four in the series, and I already have a reading vlog for this one up on my channel, and then also The Fiery Cross, which is book five, which there is a vlog coming for this one. I just haven't edited it yet. Um, but Drums of Autumn was a wild ride. <laughs> um, I ended up giving this book five stars, which I think is the first time since the first book, Outlander, which is one of my most loved books of all time, that I have actually given one of these books a five star rating. But it really was a wild ride and I really, really enjoyed it. This is the book where Jamie and Claire have arrived in the new world. They are settling down on Fraser's Ridge, which is this land in North Carolina that um, 
Jamie gets as part of like a land grant with the intention for him to bring more settlers there to settle the land and establish like a community and so he and Claire go there with their posse to set up shop as it were but this is where I feel like the story really starts to like fork in a way because Brianna and Roger become like major players in the story. Brianna is in contemporary times in like the late 1960s, early 1970s, and she discovers that her parents supposedly die in a fire because she finds like some newspaper clipping. And so she decides to go back into the past and warn her parents and try to save them. And she goes and doesn't tell Roger, who is her love interest, but yeah, he very romantically goes back in time to find her. And so their love story, Brianna and Rogers, becomes like parallel to Jamie and Claire. And I don't want to spoil, say too much about the plot because that would very much spoil it. A lot of this though has been covered in the TV show. I do have that spoilery vlog as I mentioned. Um, but it was really interesting to see this world continue to expand, to see Jamie and Claire at this point becoming comfortable with their lives together and having some sort of future together in the 18th century, even with the American Revolution kind of looming in the future for them. It's really interesting to see Brianna's relationship with her parents evolve. It's very interesting to see her relationship with Roger, who I have issues with, mind you. Her, it's interesting to see her relationship with Roger evolve. Um, so yeah, there is a lot that goes on. You also have Aunt Jocasta and River Run that becomes um, more crucial to the story. And as someone who really isn't interested in like colonial America or that history, I think it does a good job of keeping you intrigued about how the way of life might have differed from what we're currently experiencing and even what Brianna is experiencing because it's quite a culture shock for her and Roger. But I would say that this is a book that does have sexual assault in it. That is something that critics of this particular book series always bring up. It is here again. We do have another important character who is raped. So a warning there about that. Um, but overall, it was just really nice. And it was also really nice not only to have these new characters introduced, like Aunt Jocasta, but to actually see characters that we're familiar with, like um, John Gray and Willie, come back into the story, even if just momentarily. So I really did enjoy this one, and as I said, I gave it five stars. Moving on to The Fiery Cross, this one I didn't get along with quite so much. And I think this might be the longest of the Outlander books to date that I have finished. Book six, which I am currently working on, is longer than this one. Um, but this is still over 1400 pages long. So it is a chonker. Um, but I, I feel like this is a book that you need in a series to get you from like the book before it to the book after it. In a lot of ways it felt kind of like filler. I don't necessarily know that there was a ton that happened here that really made all that much of a difference, if that makes sense. So this one obviously picks up from where book five left off. Um, Jamie and Claire are at Fraser's Ridge, Brianna and Roger are there as well, but we're getting a little more 
of the sense that the storm is brewing, that the American Revolution is coming, the War of the Regulators is really the like focal point of this book, but I also feel like it happens fairly early on in the 1400 pages of the book, and then it's just a lot of everyone on the ridge figuring out how to survive on the ridge, which is interesting to a degree, but I don't know that I necessarily needed 1400 pages of this. Um, however, the steam between Jamie and Claire is still there. Jamie celebrates his 50th birthday, and so you do, in this book, understand that they are getting older. Um, they are no longer the young 20-somethings or early 30-somethings of Outlander 1 or um, Dragonfly and Amber. Like, they are mature adults. And that's really beautiful about it. I feel like middle age doesn't get celebrated enough in fiction. I feel like a lot of what's out there focuses on people in their teens, their 20s, and even their 30s, but like things happen in your midlife and when you're older. Like life doesn't stop, there is romance and things like that, so this is a nice reminder of that, but overall like there's not a whole lot that happens. Yes, there is like danger. Like all Outlander books, there's adventure. There's someone that nearly dies. There's like violence and there's smut and there's Claire trying to do Claire things, which is basically save the world one patient at a time. But this book probably could have been significantly shorter and still done everything it set out to do. It definitely, in my opinion, <laughs> did not need to be 1400 pages long. So that's all I can really say about that. I gave it three stars, so I think at this point of the six books that I have finished, this is my lowest rated book so far in the Outlander series. Um, so there is that. I won't say anything more. I don't want to spoil any of the plot, and it's very hard to talk about books in a series and not spoil the plot, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this little chatty section on Outlander, there is going to be a reading vlog on this one with spoilers where I talk more in detail about exactly what the hell happens in this book. So stay tuned. And now the last book, which was Act Your Age, Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the third book in the Brown Sisters trilogy, and I think it says a lot that I devoured this series in a few months. Like, the first time I picked up Chloe Brown was in June, and it is now the beginning of November and I have read all three books. I devoured them. I so thoroughly enjoyed the characters, and Eve Brown is no exception. Let me just say that now. I don't think I connected with her as much on a personal level as I did with Danny, but she is this like effervescent bubble of energy, and she's just completely adorable, and so is Jacob. And so when you have these two really cute characters colliding in this romantic way, it's like cuteness overload. But this is a book about Eve Brown. She's like the flightier of the Brown sisters. Um, she doesn't really take life too seriously, it seems, and she kind of flits from idea to idea to idea and really takes advantage of the, of the fact that she is from a family that is quite well off. So at the beginning of the book, her parents have decided to dole out a little tough love. They've had enough 
of her flightiness and they basically tell her you have to move out and fend for yourself like you need to adult you need to learn how to adult eve brown and so in true eve brown fashion she kind of casually pops into an interview at jacob's inn and he is completely mortified by her by her the way she dressed by the things she was saying just just everything um so they don't necessarily hit it off straight away and then she literally hits him with her car like literally and he goes to the hospital and he comes back with a broken arm and eve sticks around at the inn to help him while he recovers and that is how their relationship forms and as i said it is cuteness overload between the two of them eve is i think the book like calls her like sunshine like if you bottled sunshine that's the sort of individual she is and jacob is on the spectrum he kind of hyper focuses he is a little bit more serious a little bit more buttoned up and he just doesn't understand her but he is drawn to her and she to him and it's it's just great it's a great story of like this enemies to lover trope but enemies seems like too strong a term but there's definitely like animosity frustration confusion that eventually gives way to the lovers story and like the other two brown sister books the steam in this is steamy there is a sex scene with a sex toy that is quite hot um quite 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 smutty quite quite everything um, so bear that in mind but i do think that this was a really really interesting book and i learned a lot because i didn't realize that talia hibbert is autistic and so this is a book that is really own voice representation at its finest in these characters um jacob is constantly like explaining and like even if it's sort of internal like how he's thinking and how he's coming to the conclusions he is and why he's so hesitant about relationships in general because of his autism and it's really interesting to hear him rationalize and talk through those things but then you also have eve who over the course of the book because of her interactions with jacob and because of things that he says and questions that he asks realizes that she's very likely on the spectrum too and so you have these two characters with this m with mental illness represented the one thing i would say about that is that eve brown seems to self-diagnose herself and at no part in the book do i hear her like mention or hear it mentioned that she goes to a professional and has herself diagnosed properly so that would be like my one little like thing to pick on if I had to pick on something but overall this was a phenomenal romance once again this was four and a half stars which is I think the same thing that I gave Chloe Brown the characters were great the chemistry is just there and beautiful and the like heavier topics the communication issues everything that is there just felt really well done um not cliche and just like really mature in the sense that it's like oh it's not just like foolishness happening like these are two adults that have their issues that they need to talk through in order for a relationship to actually be viable and so i appreciate that but yeah it was again another really lovely romance so yeah those were the books that i ended up reading in september and october as i mentioned it was like a really really heavy 
romance time for me, but I don't hate it. But I will say that if there's one thing that I learned about myself in 2021 is that I might be a romance reader. Like, it's probably not a fluke that I enjoyed a romance book or two, because at this point I've read the Evie Dunmore series up to what's been published and really enjoyed it. The Talia Hibbert books, really enjoyed them two of the Helen Huang books so far and really enjoyed them and I'm still plugging along with the behemoth that is the Outlander series so I don't is this a phase I don't know it seems like it's not maybe I just tapped into something that I was missing um, but yeah overall it was a really good time reading in September and October, even if I didn't necessarily have as much time to read as I wanted to, but there were some really, like, outstanding books in this mix. So no real complaints. But yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video and that you were able to add a few books to your TBR. You know the holidays are around the corner, so this is the perfect time to slide a few books on there and ask people to get them for you. But if you did enjoy this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe because first of all it means the world to me, but it also helps my channel do a little better. So thank you again for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!